Understandably, it's going to be more difficult than anything that colleagues from Amicus have experienced because we have two major organisations, two unions with significant size, two unions with significant <coughs> financial resources, and two unions, albeit Amicus being a combination of four unions, nevertheless, a long history was larger of the two, we followed a pattern of equality. We did it in the uh, joint executive, we did it in the Rules Commission, we even did it in the approach to the first and current executive elections, <coughs> declaring it to be on the basis of 40-40. TNG colleagues in the room, and therefore I know equally, rightly, they will look at that from a viewpoint, and they may even decide that that's something they want to relate to other colleagues, but I'll say nothing here that I haven't said anywhere else, and directly, even on the executive itself. Up to the point of that first executive, there was previously three chairs. There was the vice chair and chair of the TNG, Brenda and Jimmy Kelly. Brenda retired, Jimmy Kelly was made an officer, then a regional secretary, and now a joint general secretary, leaving only one lay chair, apart from the two vice chairs that Amicus had, and that was Steve. And between the senior management team, it was understood and agreed that Steve take the chair. Which were fine. Uh, we have difficulty understanding his speech, but that's not that's not any argument for his politics. Uh, he's, he's in a difficult position casting that role. Uh, but before the meeting, we said, well, okay, this is a parity merger. If you want a chair, fine. Let's have genuinely has the same view that many of us have about the union and the way it should be run. But his own group overturned him. And that hurt him quite badly. Hurt him really badly. I saw him after he came out of that meeting. The left took 20 minutes to decide whether they were going to allow him to talk to the meeting. And then overturned him. So I think the problem here is this. I think TNG Collins <coughs> believed that they were going to get a lot more out of this merger than they're actually going to get when the reality strikes home. I believe that they were led to believe that by person or persons <coughs> unknown, you put your own names to it. And the frustration has allowed the ultra left to step into that gap, give them the wherewithal to try and vote and blunder through their own position. And that's where I think we are. I think the TNG are made up of good people like we are. There's a few in there. <laughs> so here's the problem. We know what the rule book said. Uh, you're all familiar with it, so I shan't weary you with it. I go a year longer, Tony goes a year sooner, the middle year is covered by a designate that we elect when I'm still here so that we've got both general secretaries trying to apply equality. Again, equality all the way through. But it contained the principle of me going past 65, and of course there are colleagues here from the old AU that know full well uh, the weight of that sort of argument. And I have to say, uh, I was somewhat tongue-in-cheek listening to the debate about how we could bring the two unions together at the senior level, recognising that that was going to be cast in a role the tide ones extremely criticised. Well, uh, I have to say this, as I've said on many occasions and at the time, um, and I don't want to stir up old arguments, but let me put it this way, I think that the situation in the AWU was completely different then than we are now. And that triggers two things. It triggers that Tony Woodley has to leave not later than 12 months after. And it triggers the election for the General Secretary designate. That forces me out a year early, it forces Tony Woodley a year out early, and it turns the rule book inside out as far as that, uh, that provision is concerned. It's been twice in front of the members and being carried overwhelmingly on each occasion. The challenge to that is Jerry Hicks. Was a member of the SWP and split with them, joined respect, shortly after which respect split. I don't know whether that was Jerry's responsibility. 
Um, if it keeps splitting, he'll end up in a party where he's unanimously supported, but it'll only have him in it. <laughs> but he's now currently constructing a case, I believe, uh, describing the uh, Express as uh, a moderate. Well, if there's any moderates in the room, I'm sure you're very concerned <laughs> that Jerry is now uh, Jerry is now a member, uh, and he's concerned about members' money because we had a campaign where we put the adverts that we referred to uh, attacking the Tories. Now this is interesting. Here's an ex-SWP member of respect actually criticising the union for attacking the Tories. Which had a bit of a twist really isn't it? And of course he's concerned about members' money. Despite the fact that two members two members votes for the rule book have been carried, he's decided to try and challenge to force an election which will probably cost the union half a million pounds and he's going to be complaining about the money we spend in campaigns and the money we spend in supporting the Labour Party well I can understand him being opposed to that of course but nevertheless <coughs> it's a challenge I believe is correct because it's all about me wanting to go past 2010 because I've got some aspiration to go on and on and on well, I want to tell you that if that were the case, if I wanted a, a job going on and on and on, I don't have to have a problem. Because it's been suggested to me, in fact, that I could get a job in the international side of the union, I could be the international president, it wouldn't matter if I went on till 69, I'd be able to go around the world doing what I like to do, uh, stopping in decent hotels and having the life of Riley. So if I want to go on till 60, I've no problem. As long as we don't have an election next year. It's not a problem on the veto because we could pass that on perhaps to Steve on the executive. It's not a problem on joint chairs because we could revisit that and maybe get back to joint chairs. Not necessarily can that be delivered, but that's the sort of approach. And my view is this, I'm not interested in going on to 69, 67, 66 or any age. I'm interested as I always have been in the union going forward. And I've never been afraid not to put my own interest before the interest of the union is that we go to the executive and we seek a rule amendment to enable an election to be held in the <coughs> amicus section of the union with the sole purpose of being able to qualify the winner of that <coughs> to work from 2009 December to 2010 December on the assumption, uh, the wild outside assumption that the candidate would be me and I might win what it's then seen as qualifying me within the law to actually comply with the rule book that we've already voted on is to get me to 2010 um, Jerry Hicks I think intends I was just looking I was just looking so uh, that's the proposal that's going to be put in front of the executive and it requires a number of changes possibly to defer the start date of the new rule book <coughs> in order to, because when the new rule book's in the, the sections disappear there's no amicus and no TNG section uh, however it's my legal opinion that we don't need to do that uh, we could actually not defer the start and still conduct an election within the law that's still possible but the favourite at the moment is a straight proposal to, to defer the start of the rule book. It also requires an amendment to the amicus rule book because the amicus rule book which would apply to the election says you've got to be less than 60 years of age to stand. So there'll be a consequential proposal that to the executive is that we go to the executive and we seek a rule amendment to enable an election to be held in the <coughs> amicus section of the union.